Hi, I'm Betsy Pearl Cardwell. I'm the producer of the film Compassion, and I want to thank Joe Dance for screening our film. I'm here with Jeff Corperding, who's the director, writer, and also a producer of the film. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Betsy. Thanks so much. And thank you all for watching the movie. We are going to rush right through some quick uh, Q&A afterwards. We're going to have the actors join us shortly. But first, Betsy and I are going to bounce some questions back and forth at each other submitted to us from the great folks at Joe Dance. Jeff, you wrote the stories. How did they come about and why a trilogy or were these individual stories at, at one time? They actually began as individual stories, um, one in particular. And then when I began writing a second one, I realized how they were connected. And so it sort of evolved into a trilogy. Um, and that's where the overall theme of the movie was put together. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of the trilogy, Betsy, which was the most difficult of the three parts for you to produce? Well, I didn't produce the first one. Uh, we had a different producer for that. I produced uh, two and three. And of those two, uh, I would say part two was the most difficult, although none of them were extremely difficult. So. Okay. Well, yeah, big shout out to Ted Kendrick for producing part one of, of Compassion. Um, oh, your question now for me. Oh, I'm, let me ask you this, Jeff. <laughs> Knowledge, tell us about the view progression from uh, trees to oblivion. It's meaning of what, of what he's seeing. Sure. So in part one of Compassion, he, what, what happens is that viewer that appears um, is showing him glimpses in the future. Um, so it's showing him what he doesn't see and building up to sort of the destruction of the world from an overdevelopment standpoint. And then finally, the, in the big reveal, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, um, it uh, leaves him stranded in that future desolated world. Is desolated a word? I believe so. Okay, good. <laughs> all, right, all right. Betsy, for part one, how many yeah. quarters did we lose on the ground? Oh, wow. We had a pack of, of uh, $10 worth of quarters, and I believe we lost three quarters. Added three. 75 cents to the yep. budget. Perfect. Yep, yep. So let me ask you this, Jeff. The actors were very well cast. How difficult or easy was it to find the cast for each film? It really did vary. Um, we had a little bit of casting um, snafu at the, for part one. Uh, part three was a breeze because we had two, only two characters to cast. And I had, I think we had over 22 actresses show up from um, Georgia and Tennessee, South and North Carolina. So that the difficulty there was in making the decision as to who would be cast. So um, it was, it was uh, difficult in different ways for different parts. Mm -hmm. Um, so Betsy on part two, um, can you tell us how that was shot and where it was shot and whether or not it had any impact on you in terms of your thinking about fishing and hunting? Um, well, it was shot in, uh, three different locations around Western North Carolina, including, uh, a warehouse where we built a set in Brevard, North Carolina. Um, the did it change my opinion on hunting and fishing well i've never been much of a, a hunter at all so uh, my opinion on that has not changed really i don't hate it but i don't do it and uh, i have done some fishing and i would still fish again although i do catch and release so <laughs> let me ask you jeff um what the uh, the uh in part three mm -hmm. Why shoot it as a play that becomes reality and not a straight, you know, short film? Sure. Well, that actually stems from, as I already mentioned, the way in which the overall movie developed. It began, part three was the first one that I wrote. It began as a story that was more focused on that sort of Twilight Zone episode, kind of a, a twist in terms of how she was in a play and then trapped in the reality it was only after um, I wrote part one and then filled in part two and it evolved into a bigger theme. Um, and I just never dropped that device because all of them have that same twist ending. So that's kind of how it came about. Uh, Betsy, for part three, did we use a real theater or did we build one in a studio? And what was the only set? Um, and was that the only set that we had to actually build? Part three was uh, built in the stage play was, was a set that we built and it was done on an actual stage in a, uh, in a high school. 
And um, it was not the only set we, we built. We've also built a set for uh, part two, which and put the set in the in a warehouse. Um, the uh, the the fishing store is a, is a fishing store is a is a set built, and uh, part one was filmed outdoors, but we did build a set for that. Right. Um, in terms of where he's um, shooting, um, and uh, there were none of them were difficult to build, but the you know, um, let me ask you, Jeff, how difficult was shooting a uh, a stage play as a film, cuts, close-ups, not just a wide shot. How long did it take to film? So um, referring to part three, which happens in part on a stage, the mm -hmm. stage portion took about two and a half days to film. The overall movie took about five and a half, six days to, to film. I found it actually much easier because you've got, you've got lights, you've got a fourth wall, and the fact that it was supposed to look like a um, an actual stage made it easy because we didn't have to worry about showing the lights or the edge of the scenery or anything that was there on purpose. So I actually found it easier to shoot on the stage. Our only issue was making certain that nobody fell off during filming. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> so Betsy, um, part three was, uh, did I, did I base that on an actual play? It's a trivia question for you. I don't, Oh, did you? I, Jeff is asking me this because of my background is theater, and <laughs> I the answer's no. I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to come up with something. I was thinking of something from the fifties, but now I can't think of anything. No, it was all it was all yeah. um, fiction, all for the for the point of telling that particular story. Um, so let me leave you, Betsy, with a quick question about any memorable stories that happened to you or to our cast and crew during filming. My memories of this film was um, working on a low budget and just having the cooperation and the, the help from so many people, not, not just the cast and crew, which you always expect um, to, to, to you know, pull everything together and work, but also I have to just give a shout out to the people that provided us with locations. Um, oh, yeah. They gave up their businesses, their, you know, uh, homes and and there and and I I just was so grateful to them because you know we didn't have any money to pay them for the location and they were so accommodating so so accommodating the bed and breakfast made coffee for us I mean <laughs> yep. it was it was just wonderful so yep. I'm not, that was my biggest memory yeah the community support was amazing yeah, definitely yeah. So I'm going to cut us off right there and introduce our first actors. Betsy will be back at the end of our Q&A. And now let's get to our first actor. Joining me now is Alina Strauss, who played the little girl in part two of Compassion. Hi, Alina. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, good. So I've got some questions that the folks at um, Joe Dance wanted me to ask you. I want to start off. They, they really enjoyed the blue streak in your hair, and they wanted to know if that was your idea or the director's idea. It was the director's. <laughs> but you did you did get to take it home with you, right? Mm -hmm. Did you ever wear it after the shoot? Yeah. Oh, good, good. It's pretty nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so they wanted to know also whether or not you have been fishing yourself and whether or not this movie made you think about that any differently. Well, I've never really been a big fisher, but if I did fish, it would definitely change, like, how I did it. Okay. All right. Now, thinking about your character, the little girl who came in and did this thing to the to the bait uh, and tackle shop owner, do you think she was more of a just like a spirit or a demon, or do you think she was just a girl asking questions? I think she was a spirit. Yeah. And what do you th do? You think she represented anything in particular? Not really. I don't. Okay. I don't know. All right. All right. So um, what have you been doing um, since we filmed Compassion? Um, I've been doing commercials and films, but there's not a lot since COVID. Sure, sure. Yeah, we've all been sort of uh, cooped up, which is why we're here instead of going over and, uh, <laughs> and watching the movie yeah. um, with everybody. Hopefully next year we'll, we'll all be able to get back out again and do that. Mm -hmm. um, 
Do you have any specific um, anecdotes or stories you remember from the filming? Um, I remember whenever you put in the red streak of hair in your hair. Oh. <laughs> so basically goofing off behind the scenes. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Did you enjoy filming the movie? Yes. And do you like how you turned out on screen? Yeah. Good, good. Well, I hope you're proud of it. Um, and please keep us all up to date on any films and other projects you're in. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. With me now is Lavin Cudahy, who played our bait and tackle shop owner in part two of Compassion. How are you doing, Lavin? I'm doing great, Jeff. How about yourself? Not bad, not bad. So let me get to right to the questions. Um, the shop owner that you played was obviously a very compassionate man. He showed it towards his customers. Um, how did you relate to the character? Uh, well, you know, I have to say that the character, he was... Uh, Initially, he was somewhat easy to portray, and it's not because I identified with him so much, but I understood him. I understood his plight in this. Uh, you know, this fisherman, this fishing fisher shop owner, uh, I characterize him as kind of a failed sportsman. Okay. Uh, he inherited this, uh, and I, this is, you know, me, uh, he inherited this lakeside business from his successful sportsman dad. So his dad was a success and uh, he wasn't. <laughs> so, you know, they, they, you know, I think he kind of felt trapped. He felt trapped in a, uh, this small world of failed ambitions and uh, an obligation to take on his dad's legacy. Sure. Carry yeah. that on. Well, as I mentioned, he, he obviously was a good guy. Do you think he really deserved the, the young girl's wrath? I most certainly do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I expected you to say. No, well, I did, but in a different way. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I feel that, uh, you know, this guy was a lonely guy, and I think, I think just because of now, this is how I characterized him: his his failed success, mm -hmm. uh, the abuse that he experienced, the beatings, the that, and even the uh, what you might want to say the assumed death. I don't want to right. say he actually died, right. but his assumed death. Uh, it was kind of a, a reckoning for him. He was he was facing his failure, so. That little girl, my take on it, was an extension of himself. Oh, interesting. All right. Um, so, so a lot of people look at this particular part of the movie differently um, in terms of the, the fishing aspect and the decision to make the, uh, the fishing depicted as somewhat as a, of a questionable act, at least in the way he did it in the movie, for fun. Um, are you, do you fish? And if so, did this movie make you think any differently about that? Uh, no, I'm not a fisherman. Oh. No, I, uh, the only, the one and only time I ever went fishing was in high school on a bicycle trip that my brother and I took. We took like a 90 mile uh, overnight bicycle trip. And uh, I took a piece of uh, string about yay long Tied some hot dog on the end of it, tossed it in a stream, caught me a catfish, and that was the extent. I felt sorry for that little guy dangling on the end. Threw him back. Okay. Well, good, good. So you sort of got the idea behind the uh, the fishing for fun aspect, but uh, yeah, good, good. Um, well, well, actually, actually, mm, yes and no, because. Uh, I do believe that, you know, if, if you want to put food on your table and you want to fish or you want to go hunt, have at it. Uh, these guys that overfish, overhunt, uh, the guys that do it uh, as sportsmen for trophies, uh, it's very difficult for me to wrap my head around that. Sure. Well, and there, was, there are definitely some folks who have seen the movie and didn't really get that that that, that we were really, I think, differentiating between the two, which is why she says to your character in the movie, you know, you, you didn't even do it for food. You 
did it just for fun. And and of course the trophies on the wall being the actual. Right. So I, I when we when well I, that was my character. I mean personally. Oh right. You know, right. 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 Yeah. All right. So um, do you remember any specific stories from filming? Any fun anecdotes that you'd like to share? Uh, from this particular shoot. Yes. Yeah. Um, He's a no. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> there was there was this one day. I, I do believe it was the last day, and and it wasn't particularly entertaining. <laughs> so, but I think it was I think it was twelve hours of uh, of of thrashing me around the floor. Yeah, uh, and 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 <clears throat> interestingly enough, uh, although it was uncomfortable at times. Uh, I kept coming back. Everybody was very professional on that. And so every time, which was a lot of, it was difficult takes to make, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, everybody was just right on top of it, wanting to make it work and making it work, you know? Right. It took a mm -hmm. long time for, you know, how long was that on screen? Oh, 20, right, yeah. yeah. 15, 25 seconds, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, and so anybody, who, the folks who watched the movie should know that nobody filled in for you those that was you going up on the counter that was me the over the counter into the barrels yep uh crawling to the phone one of my favorite shots yeah it was fake blood though we didn't really we didn't really um damage you that badly for sure all right thank you so much live and really appreciate your time hey thank you jeff you have a fabulous evening thanks joining me now is emily tynan mcdaniel who played ingrid in part three of compassion hi emily hello jeff how are you i'm well how are you doing i'm fine thank you okay. well let's dive right into the questions real quickly that um, we got from joe dance mm -hmm. um, how did you adapt your acting for the character going from being an actress on stage to a woman in an unexpected reality yeah good question um so uh, a lot of actors do both film and stage work. And with stage work, um, you have some, the, the art underneath is the same, but the craft is a little bit different. You rely a lot more on your physicality to present what your, your character is experiencing and you sort of project more with your voice. Part of the reason I like working in smaller theaters because I don't project all that naturally. Um, and with film, since everything is caught um, very easily, there's a lot more subtlety to it, a lot more stillness, a lot more internal experience that just sort of reads through your eyes or just the energy in the room. So what was tricky about this is that the stage portion, where ordinarily I'd maybe be, if I were actually on stage, I would be a little bit more physical, is still actually on film. And it was something that you and I had talked about that we didn't want it to read as being like really overblown or campy stage acting. Um, but I do, the character, the stage acting um, was much more physical, much more vocal. Um, and then the experience of the, of the character as she sort of enters this other reality became much more internal, much more um, an emotional experience, much stiller. And it actually wasn't too hard to do because the emotions of each of those two characters, the emotional experiences of those two characters were quite separate. Right. So. Well, speaking to that, then less, um, less of a question about your acting technique and such. Um, how do you think the character's development went in terms of being um, a character on stage and as the actress herself and then into that reality? Yeah. And even in the beginning, there was that, um, that third, the sort of the actress character. Behind the scenes, um, right. Yeah, that behind the scenes. Uh, and really those emotional experiences. So a lot of actors use a technique. Um, a lot of people call it like, I know myself like this when I'm sure you I'm sure you've talked to people about this, but it's a way to emotionally connect with whatever the experience is of each of those characters. And the first, um, the actress character, the behind the, the stage, right. um, was very joyful, uh, almost a little motherly, protected, very connected to her co-star. The second character, the stage actress, was very um, defensive, angry, separated, and very aloof, not interested in getting involved in the experiences of her fellow man. The third actor, the third character, um, was had a totally different emotional 
landscape, she was overwhelmed, terrified, confused, um, at a certain point, quite tender with the other person there with her, Camila, um, and finally stepped into the role of being, of recognizing her responsibility in that, in that moment. And that aloofness just dropped away and she became quite connected. So those three people, for lack of a better term, even though there were really kind of one person in different iterations, just had just entirely different experiences. Yeah. So it was sort of easy to separate, that was sort of, sort of saying before, it was easy to separate those three out as having really distinct experiences. Oh, good, good. Well, back to the craft question. Did you, before going into this, um, have any experience playing violin? <laughs> Jeff, I think you know I did not. Uh, and anybody who had been in the room when I was practicing needed earplugs. It was so painful. But no, I had no experience with violin, but I was lucky enough to have a wonderful coach, Kate Bryant, um, who is a violinist here in town. Incredible, uh, very patient, <laughs> very supportive. Um, and she actually, I mean, I'm sure you said this already, but she made a little cameo um, right. as like the body double. Uh, so she was great. So I was very lucky for that. And I apologize again to everyone who had to hear. <laughs> I, I remember you telling us how difficult it was on the set to stay in character while you were mm. listening to the violin music playback, but also, you know, you can't, you couldn't mimic the violin without actually playing some sort of sound. And right. so hearing yourself play, which may not have been <laughs> up to par, <laughs> and, and staying in character was even a more cha more challenging for you at that point because it's like yeah. trying to be playing an emotional scene where it's, when someone over there is just off camera yelling at you or something like that exactly so. exactly <laughs> but it's i'm yelling at myself <laughs> yeah. uh, well no kate said you were a fantastic um student one of her best mm. ever but i think we all know that even the best of students um, two weeks into learning violin, <laughs> there's only a certain skill level you can get to. So. <laughs> well, it was fun. It was fun to get to try that one on. Right. For me, for the rest of the crew, it might've been a little, but. And what about <laughs> the German language? Did you speak that before? Do you no, speak any I, other languages? I do, I do speak other languages. I speak Spanish and I know sign language, but um, I have never spoken German before, but again, very, very lucky to have a wonderful coaching Patsy um and yeah just very lucky to uh have that support and um coaching there yeah okay. yeah awesome now did you have a favorite um uh, time during filming or uh, something about the filming process on these shoots that you enjoyed the most yeah, absolutely the rest of the crew yeah um it just i felt like we were all on a team together i felt like the the turnaround was really quick our time was quite tight but i felt like everybody was excited and passionate, you know, hair and makeup and every, you know, the production and everybody. Um, and obviously working with you is amazing. Um, and working with uh, Camila, I, it's, it's very difficult to describe what it's like to be, um, if, you, if you've ever acted across from someone who's not really present with you, it's like incredibly lonely right. and it's almost like a little embarrassing. And it, it, it kind of makes, I don't know, it, it makes you want to, it's hard not to turn in. But well, Camila I was just is, say it's very internal at that point versus mm -hmm. being out there and, and more vulnerable, obviously. I, I feel just the same way. And, you know, when Camila's in the room with you, she is 100% there, whether the camera's on her or not. And it just, I felt so connected to her. I felt like the energy between us was really, really good. And I just felt really, yeah, the team and Camila and yeah. Well, I think, that, I think that connection certainly showed for sure. Um, so tell us real quick, last question, and I'll let you go. Um, what have you been doing since we filmed um, part three of Compassion and what do you have um, lined up? Yeah, I've been, well, you know, 2020 is a slow year for actors, <laughs> um, like most performing arts. Uh, I wasn't able to get back into theater. I did a Zoom play, uh, which was a cool idea. <laughs> Um, and I've worked on a couple of other projects, a couple of TV shows and a couple of um, films. Well, yeah. we can follow you on um, Facebook and online and see what, whatever projects you have coming up that way. So um, yeah. 
Thank you so much, Emily. I'm going to jump off now, say goodbye to you, and I'm going to meet with um, Camilla and see if she has nice things to say about oh, you. Oh, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Joining me now is Camilla Escobar, who played Sarah in part three of Compassion. Hi, hi Camilla. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I almost said, hi, Sarah. How are you? Um, <laughs> so let's jump right into the questions. How did you adapt your acting, your performance with this character who began as a backstage actress, then an onstage actress, and then into the actual um, maid in that scenario, the reality at the end of the story. How did you adapt your acting to pull that off? Yeah, so there were many factors that I had to keep in mind when I was transitioning from each of the characters. Um, the first thing was intention. What was my character's intention in that moment? Obviously, when I was a backstage actor, my intention was to have a good performance, which was much different than at the end when my intention was literally to survive. So um, I think having that in the back of my mind, what was my intention as the character was a really, really um, helpful factor in making that transition. Also, um, really taking in the stakes, like when the stakes were raised. When I was a performer on stage, obviously the stakes are high. I don't want to mess up in front of a bunch of people, but when I'm literally having to hide in a cupboard because I don't want to get taken away to a concentration camp like that, the stakes were so much higher. So I think it was really just investing in those and finding that shift and also status. Um, when I was a backstage actor, me and um, Emily, like we had the same status. So we were both actors on a stage, um, but you know, towards the end, the status was obviously, there was a shift because it wasn't just about a performance. It was really, really happening. So I think making that shift mentally um, really, really helped me. Also, I am a theater actor, so I know what it's like to, you know, be backstage and to be on stage. And that was, you know, that's kind of a tricky situation being like, okay, I'm an actor playing an actor who is a character. Like, yeah. I guess when I was doing that, I didn't, tried it like I tried to simplify it in my mind I was like yeah I'm an actor but I am an actor so I can just portray this character as I would if I were on stage which is different than if you know than on film so I kind of used my theater background to assist me in that way as well I thought maybe when you were in the back um backstage scene that you might sort of default into that um, I'll just be me kind of thing because like you said yeah. you are a stage performer so exactly exactly that was definitely the backstage performer was definitely I pulled a lot of inspiration from myself for that because I was like I've been through this so many times this is literally me so but then obviously towards the end I was like this is nothing like me whatsoever so I really 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 had to use um, the given circumstances the stakes my intention all of that to really help create that character for myself Great. So how important, I mean, you, you performed with Emily, how important is it to have a strong chemistry or connection with an acting partner um, in terms of bringing out each other's performances to their best? It is so important. One of the most important parts of acting, actually, if not the most important part is the other person. You like the entire interaction is so important. And I'm going to admit it. I have worked with actors before who I didn't have great chemistry with and I've still done a good job, but the process is just so much easier when you have an actor who you have good chemistry with. And I know for me and Emily, we had great chemistry. Like we had very similar, we would just talk about it after like backstage all the time. And I really enjoyed working with Emily. I felt like she was very easy to connect with and to talk to about the role. But yes, I have worked with actors who we have different styles and techniques and it is more difficult. I guess um, it doesn't, it won't heavily, heavily, heavily impact the performance, but it really does impact the process. It um, makes things so much easier when you have an, an actor who you can connect with really really easily so it does it does have a big impact i think um i think from uh, the standpoint of watching that i think what happens is you can have an excellent performance but then there's that something extra that just gets exactly. added to it you know that it factor that some people have and the same is true with that kind of, and, and usually they we just have to default to saying they had great chemistry we can't really express it in any other way exactly. other than the fact that they heightened each other so. and that's i guess when the 
chemistry isn't supernatural and it isn't already there that's when you have to use a lot of technique which makes things harder you have to layer more layers on top and um truly just raw human chemistry with another actor is just so much easier it's just experiencing it instead of having to layer on a bunch of technique on top which I you know I've had to do sometimes when I'm with a um an acting partner who I don't have great chemistry with but I can definitely say with Emily I had a fantastic time and she was probably honestly I can say that she was my favorite actor I've ever worked with oh I was waiting for that one of just to cover your bases but you actually declared it that your favorite wow Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure she'll be excited to hear that yeah. So, um, thinking about the movie as a whole, not just your part, um, how do you feel about the concept that compassion isn't really compassion unless there is some sort of an element of action involved? I fully agree. This is really funny because we were actually talking about this in class um, when I was at the governor's school. We were talking about like the levels of um, truly understanding another person and it was pity empathy wait no pity sympathy empathy and compassion and we were talking about that and I was like that's so funny I was in a I was in a film about compassion. I know the answer to this one <laughs> yeah but we were talking about that because we were talking about like truly understanding a character which kind of connects to truly understanding a person and I fully agree because I feel like um you know pity is like oh I feel bad for them sympathy is like I don't really I've never been through that but I can understand what they're going through empathy is I know exactly what you're going through I've been through that but compassion I feel like is truly like not just thinking about it and you know being like I've been there but truly taking action which I like yes you can impact people when you don't take action but like I think I fully agree that taking action is the is the change like it's the most it's what makes compassion compassion and not empathy you know right well i think everything up to that point is just so internalized I that fully agree. While, while it has a great impact on you personally and and may change your behavior in some way it, it doesn't really do anything you know it, it, exactly it, there's no benefit to it unless you can turn it into some action exactly like how far is saying oh i've been exactly what i've been through exactly what you've been through like how far is that going to get somebody it's going to probably help them feel a little bit better for a little bit but it's not truly going to have a, a huge impact on them right. so yeah i totally agree that action is definitely what sets compassion apart from all the other things that come before it Right. Excellent. Do you have um, do you have any memories uh, from the shoot um, anecdotes or interesting stories that you recall? Um, not necessarily from the actual filming. Oh, God. But I vividly remember the fear that I felt when I was stuck in that hallway in the middle of a class change and I was surrounded by about 50 teenage boys and I ran to the bathroom. Let me tell you. We filmed at the at a private all boys school, so I was like, I had didn't like, I kind of knew, but you know, I hadn't really seen anybody because I had just been backstage, you know, and stuff. I I was in the hallway, and all of a sudden the bell rang, and I can describe you. There were bloods of teenage boys just coming out of the class, and I was so terrified. I was like 15 years old. I was like, I I ah and I and they were all staring at me because they're like what the heck is this girl doing like at our school because it's an all boys school I, they, yeah. I was so scared like I ran to the bathroom so yes I definitely got stuck in the middle of a class change with a bunch of teenage boys who were a lot older than me and it was terrifying <laughs> so I, that was fun <laughs> I had not heard that story so my apologies for that it's not. <laughs> I don't care. Like I said, I said you were terrified. They were very confused. I'm sure coming out to find you there. But wow. All right. So can you tell us pretty quickly just what you've been doing since um, we've made compassion, and also uh, what your plans are for the future? Yeah, of course. So um, obviously. I go to the South Carolina Governor School for the Arts and Humanities now. I have been there for my junior and senior year. You know, because of coronavirus, things are a little bit difficult. So I'm currently doing virtual school, which is really difficult when you're studying theater. But um, luckily, I just was able and very fortunate to come back from a two week residency where I got to live amongst my peers and um, actually have a performance, a socially distanced masked performance, (laughs) which was uh, it was uh, virtual, but it was a lot of fun. And so, yeah, um, I've been at governor's school for my junior and senior year. I'm currently a senior. Um, sadly, at governor's school, because of the training and because of the rigor of the program, I'm not really allowed to work outside of school. I have I have done 
quite one or two short films, but the school does not know about those. But um, we're, we're recording this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I don't care. I don't care. I'm a senior. I'm just. <laughs> But um, yeah, I have done a, um, a couple of short films. I have not been able to do any theater since I've been at Governor School. I had, I did do theater after Compassion. I was actually in a show simultaneously while I was doing Compassion, which, oh, I overbooked myself. I don't regret any of it, but that was some of the hard, that was the busiest I've ever been in my life. I was filming Compassion for like, what, eight to 10 hours during the day starting. I had to leave my house at like five in the morning. Then I came back, I had a 30 minute dinner break and then I had to perform for three hours. I got home at 11, then had to wake up at like, what, 4.30 in the morning again. It was a lot of fun. It was hard though, but I did that show. That was Wait Until Dark at Greenville Theater. But basically I've just, been training really you know governor school is training um training and getting ready for college you know I um unlike many of my peers at governor school I actually don't want to pursue a BFA in acting but I want to rather get a BA in theater so I can double major because I'm also um a very academic student who wants um you know I want uh it's not because I feel like I wouldn't survive with a career as just an actor. I genuinely just love um, science and I really want to pursue that as well. So I've just, a lot of my um, focus has been going towards college recently. So your second major is going to be something in science? Yes, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm kind of, um, I'm thinking like biological sciences, public health, environmental science, anything like in that realm, I'm really, really interested in, so... Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to um, seeing your performances in the future. I expect I'll see you on TV or in movies. I have uh, very little doubt of that. And I'm sure it'll be something along the lines of some press report about how this new TV actress has also got a PhD and whatever, that kind of report. That's the goal. That's the goal. <laughs> so I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. Thank you. Of course. I had a great time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, that pretty much wraps it up for us. Thanks to all the actors, all the cast and crew. And thank you, Betsy, for joining us here um, on our special Q&A for Joe Dance for our short film, Compassion. Hey, I, I have a question for you, Jeff, before we leave. Yeah. What's, what's your most memorable experience of filming? Oh, okay. Um, well, it's actually not quite with filming. When, when we were filming um, part three, you may recall that two of our cast members who had just met for the first time began dating. And by the yeah. time we were done filming and editing and, and, and so forth, about a year later, they actually got married. That's right. So um, our movie, uh, Compassion, brought two people together, which was really a beautiful thing. Yeah, there was compassion right there. Yeah, right there. <laughs> um, and, and we got invited to the wedding, which was also lovely. So I know. That's we like really got to get invited. So, so you can think what you want about the movie, but this movie uh, brought two people together, and that, that's yeah. a wonderful story. So, all right, well, awesome. thank you to everyone from Joe Dance and for all of you for watching our short film, Compassion. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you uh, follow us so that you can see what we do next. Yes, thank you.